Hi and welcome to Ganada Anglican Church Online for this Sunday, the 29th of August. My name is David and uh, it's great to have you with us, whether you're a regular or joining us for the first time. There can be all sorts of distractions uh, around us in our home or wherever else you're watching this. So let's begin our time with a prayer, asking God to help us to focus now on what he wants to speak to us through his word. Uh, this prayer asks God to help us to love him by giving him the attention he deserves. So let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily honour you as you rightly deserve. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, those scattered, let's now gather as God's people by praising our Heavenly Father in song. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring. Jesus promises us that when two or three are gathered together in his name, he is with us. And so if you're meeting together with other Christians in your household today, then that is truly church. And a great thing for us to do together is to declare what we believe or who we believe in. And we're going to do that now with words taken from Revelation chapter 5. Uh, the words will be on the screen. If you're watching this, let us join with the elders and creatures in heaven, praising Christ for who he is. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood 
you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Let us join with 10,000 times 10,000 angels in praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and honour and praise. And let us join with every creature in honouring our Saviour. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Now as we come up to our Bible readings, just a recap on where we're up to in the book of Esther. The action is set in the city of Susa, the capital of the ancient kingdom of Persia. The year is around 480 years before Christ. Last week we heard how the evil Haman, the Prime Minister, had planned genocide, that is to have all the Jews across the Persian Empire killed. And so this week we hear about the response of the two main Jewish characters, Mordecai and Esther. How will they respond to this terrible news? Well, let's come to our Bible readings, thanks to the Whartons. Well, hello friends, uh, Alex is my name. We've got two readings this morning. I'm going to be doing the first one from Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39, and Jen uh, will be doing the second one. Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The second reading comes from Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to, to be put on instead of sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to, to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. 
Hathek went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we have these words of Scripture before us today from Esther chapter 4. We thank you, Lord, that we learn from the Scriptures about how to obey you and how to live for you. Teach us today and change us where we need to change. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now this might seem obvious to say to you, but all over the world, people are grouped into different languages. In fact, if you know anything about our missionaries, you know that language and culture go together. That is, you can't properly understand a culture unless you know the language. And you cannot understand language unless you understand the culture of a group of people. Uh, actually, that's even true for all of us, even um, in places in Australia, where broadly speaking, we have the same language and the same culture. Here, there are subcultures and sub-languages. And you only have to sit among these uh, groups of people to know that that's true. For example, if you sat among a group of young skateboarders, uh, you will know exactly what they mean. They have their own language and their own culture. Now in Esther chapter 3, we came into the dark place of the book. Um, we looked directly into the culture that is opposing the people of God. And their language is one of destruction. It is, it is disturbing and it is a true clash of language and culture because the language and culture of the empire opposes the language and culture of the Jews in its religious sense. You understand and remember, of course, that these, uh, this passage is not about uh, nations. It's actually about what is at the heart of a nation, what they worship. And for Mordecai and Esther, it is the uncompromising worship of one God, Yahweh. The clash uh, between the language and culture of the empire and the language um, and culture of Yahweh has a very, very long history and it endures to this day. Now, when we look at Esther chapter 4, we can actually see how this idea of language and culture shaped the story. Um, we'll mention that in a moment. But there is a key question um, that we need to answer before we delve into the chapter. You see, for Queen Esther, who has been absorbed into the superficially powerful language and culture of the empire, and who we find now is in a position to act um, for the language and culture of her own people, well, what is going to happen? What is she going to do? Now, we can answer that question by looking at the changing languages within the passage. So there are four languages, and the first one is the language of identity. So from the chapter, when Mordecai had learned of all that had been done, all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloths and ashes, and went in, out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate. 
because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. So until recently in the story, the main players, Mordecai and Esther, have had a secret from the empire, and it's no longer a secret. The people of God and their distinctive worship of one God um, has been exposed, and then so has the hatred um, of the people of God. Now, the last thing we heard in chapter 3 was that the city of Susa was bewildered. And now we watch a man who is representing uh, the people, God's people, openly grieving at what's happening. God's people are no longer hiding. Instead, they are stricken with grief. It is actually the grief and the identity that lock Mordecai out of the citadel, the place of power. Because he is a Jew and because he is grieving, though for a time he was regarded as an insider, now he is most definitely on the outsider, on the outside. So that's the language of identity. Let's turn now and look at the language of the empire. Again, now when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. Now we know that there are lines of communication between Esther and Mordecai and when she hears of Mordecai's action, Esther becomes distressed. Now notice the word distress, that's actually something very different from Mordecai's grief. Uh, Esther, it seems, doesn't know what's going on in the kingdom, or if she does, then her reaction is quite strange. But notice also Esther's action in response to Mordecai's grief. Uh, she brings him clothes to cover his grief. Now, this might be a little speculation, but it's clear that Mordecai's grief is due to Haman's edict to destroy God's people, but what about Esther's distress? Is that just distress, simply the fact that Mordecai is upset? There is actually something in this idea, I think, that Esther's response is to deal with Mordecai in the language of the empire. Remember, the empire is superficially powerful and Esther's response is superficial. She wants to cover up the grief of Mordecai. So for this moment, Esther speaks the language of the empire she has the idea that something visible will solve the problem that is actually a deep and enduring problem. Now notice the strength of Mordecai's response to this effort to suppress his grief in verses 6 and 7. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. My speculation for a moment, I think, is a right speculation. Esther didn't really believe what was happening or didn't understand what was happening. However, when Mordecai then gives her instructions, to, they, they carry the weight of what's actually going on. And she must go into the king and plead and beg for mercy. Recognising the gravity of the situation calls for a change of language from Esther. And this is what precisely what Mordecai does when he tells her to plead for mercy for her people. She needs to change her language from the language of the empire to the language of faith. And that's our next heading. So this exchange in the conversation between Mordecai and Esther, from Mordecai's point of view, reveals the language of faith. Esther recognises then um, what Mordecai is saying and colloquially she replies, 
You have got to be kidding. If I do this, I have to risk my life. Again from Esther, all the king's officials and the people of the royal province know that any person who pro approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go into the king. So Mordecai knows this. Now Esther knows this. And at first, as far as Esther is concerned, the situation is hopeless. Now remember, though, that one of the key themes of this book is the weakness of the people of God within the kingdoms of men. And Esther explains this, reminding Mordecai that she actually has no power. Even though she is the queen, she can't just walk into the presence of the king unless he asks for her. And this is the power of kings. Uh, at a word, they can end your life. So what place does Esther have? Well, Mordecai's response alerts us um, to the language of faith that provides the impetus for a change here. So Morde Mordecai um, begins the most important speech and the most important short words um, of the whole story. He says this in verses 13 and 14. Don't think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will be spared. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai says to her, if Esther thinks she can solve this problem by remaining a secret Jew, then she will just continue the language of the empire. But he here is speaking the language of faith. I wonder if you noticed it. It is the language of covenant promises. The language here is not based on sight, but on the promises that come from God's word. Mordecai reasons something like this. If what God promised is true, then that Abraham's descendants will be more numerous than the sand on the seashore and the stars, then it's not possible that this event that Haman has set in motion will happen. It's not possible for all of the Jews to be eradicated. On the basis of this and on Esther's position, he urges her to act and he reasons again. These events have not just happened. These are not a coincidence. And Esther, maybe you are there to do something. Maybe God has placed you there to save God's people. So that's the language of faith. And now we move to the last language we find here, and that is the language of dependency. And it's seen in prayer. Esther sends this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Here is the critical moment. Did you notice Esther repents? Did you notice she turns around? You see, acting in response to Mordecai's faith, where there has previously been little courage, Esther changes direction. This is a radical transformation. Previously, we can see it also in this. See, previously Esther has merely been the receiver of instructions. But her courage and her faith change her and now she becomes the giver of instructions. The words that Esther uses actually indicate to us that Esther has now accepted who she is, firstly as a woman of God and then as the queen. And her instructions to Mordecai demonstrate that she's changed. She has switched now from dependency on the language and the culture of the empire to the language and culture of faith. Mordecai has shown Esther what faith looks like. Esther has received it. Esther is now no longer an emissary of the empire. 
She is an emissary of the Lord God for whom she now pledges her very life. Well, at the beginning of this chapter, we asked ourselves what we might learn from the decision that Esther makes. When we come across any Old Testament character or story like this, our instinct is to equate ourselves with the hero of the story. Um, perhaps we wonder how we could be like Esther in the way that we live our lives. Now, that's true that um, the, the actions and the life of Esther are very relatable to us, but I don't think it's correct for us to link Esther directly with ourselves. Old Testament stories are relatable, but one thing we need to learn when we're reading the Old Testament is that we're not the hero in the story. God is always the hero when it comes to our application. So what we see in here is not a direct equation between Esther and ourselves. But we do see this, a weak and a vulnerable person who enters into the stronghold of the powerful <clears throat> and mediates for deliverance for the people. This story actually equates to something that is much bigger than you or me, something that neither of it, none of us could ever achieve because this story draws a line to a greater mediator. In Esther chapter 4, this mediator, Esther, faces the possibility of her death and she gladly goes where she may die. The greater mediator that we're talking about, however, faces the reality of death and actually does perish on behalf of the people. So when we read this chapter, our primary response should be one of gratitude to the mediator that Esther is pointing us to and to the language of faith of this mediator who trusts ultimately in the promises of God and that this mediator that we are looking for is actually successful for us. That is, you see, you and I are under a sentence of death. We face a serious and a deadly plight. We need access to the ultimate power. And we need to ask who will go into that place of power and plead for our lives on our behalf. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus. Now, that's the first and the most legitimate line for us to draw in this story. But there is something else for us to consider. So I want you to ponder for a moment Esther's bravery. So what, what we have here um, is a woman who began this exchange with the language of the empire. Now, consider for a moment that when we mix with the people of the empire, this too is one of our greatest challenges. We can default to the language of the empire, look for superficial or quick fixes to the problems of our lives or the problems of the world. However, Esther's bravery foreshadows a courage for us as believers in the promises of God. So what I mean is that we are not mediators of an eternal covenant. We're not mediators of eternal promises. But nevertheless, we can still listen and hear the words that Mordecai speaks to Esther. God has placed you where you are for such a time as this. Now, we're living in a strange time, aren't we? COVID has upset our lives in many ways. In fact, one thing that I think that this disease is teaching us is that the language and culture of individualism is a failure. And that is the primary language and culture of our Western world at the moment. However, the language and culture of faith, of the worship of the one true God, calls God's people away from the language of the empire. And it calls us to use a different language and to live a different life from the language and culture of the empire. It is the language of faith. It's not maybe either. It is definite. You see, God has placed his people wherever they are in the world and whenever they are in the world for such a time as this. 
our language and our culture in such a time as this must be the language and culture of faith. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for placing before us the language and culture of faith. Teach us how to trust you at a time like this. Teach us how to be brave for such a time as this. And teach us not to default to the language and culture of the empire, but to remember the language and culture of your promises eternally once and for all delivered. Amen. Well, thank you, Simon. Simon has reminded us that God has placed his people where they are for such a time as this, that wherever we are, we are to be lights and witnesses pointing people to Jesus, our mediator. Let's sing about what it is to be a light now. We also heard in the Esther reading today and from Simon's words that the language and thinking of God's people is to be one of dependence on God. And so prayer is our main way of doing that. So let's join together in a time of prayer. Firstly, we're going to have the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that declares that God's kingdom is the one that really matters above the kingdoms of this world. It declares our dependence um, on God also in this prayer for all that we need, our food, our forgiveness, our fight against temptation. Uh, let's join in the Lord's Prayer, which will be up on the screen if you're watching. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thanks now to Gay, who's going to continue leading us in prayer. Psalm 34 begins, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting Lord, we come before you today in different places, singly or in family situations, but all gathered to praise and glorify your name and to sing in our hearts your praises. Father, how blessed we are as your people to be able to freely praise and worship you as our dear Lord God without fear of persecution. So many others live in fear as they worship you secretly in various parts of our world, and we know that we must not take our freedom lightly. Father God, you are the mighty maker of heaven and earth, and we praise you for who you are, our God, the one who determines the earth's rotation, the sun's rising and setting, and the patterns of the weather for our world. Everything works as you ordained it, and we are so thankful that this is the assurance we need each and every day, that you work in ways that we cannot know, but which we can be assured are for our good, even though we struggle to see it many times. Father, forgive our doubts and fears when we so often start to think as the secular world does and forget that your ways are not our ways and that our role is to trust and believe in Jesus and his amazing free gift of his own life for us. Forgive us when we struggle to see our way ahead and fail to trust that everything works for good for those who love you. We confess that we take our eyes off Jesus and start to flounder as we consider the future many times. Dear Lord, forgive us for the times this past week when we have been unforgiving, harsh in our words and critical of others. Forgive us when we have felt weak and shattered, when things have not gone our way. And please help us to stay strong in our work for you, whatever that may be. Help us to be always thinking in a godly way when dealing with others. May we always have a ministry mindset with all our thoughts and words and deeds, seeking always to serve others in the name of your dear Son. Thank you that we have that assurance that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to earth to live, die and rise again so that all who follow him would have the assurance of eternal life in heaven when we trust and believe in him. What a blessed assurance that is for us all. May we keep that message in our hearts and minds this week and not be led astray into thinking that this world is all there is. Our lives here on earth are but a very small part of your plan for this world and you determine our steps, even though we cannot see it many times. Father God, at this difficult time in our world's history, we bring before you the people of, of Afghanistan and the terrible situation there. Father, we ask for your hand to be upon this situation as we fear for our Christian brothers and sisters over there and the many and varied situations they may be in. We ask that somehow you would intervene and bring safety to so many who are suffering in what looks like a hopeless situation. Help the leaders to make careful decisions in this conflict based on goodwill and compassion for all the people involved and take away the hatred and unconcern for human life, which seems to be paramount there at the moment. Be with all those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. And Father, as we think about the leaders over the air, there, we ask for your hand to be upon the leaders of all nations, particularly Australia, as they struggle to contain this awful virus which is wrecking such havoc across nations. Help them all to make wise and careful decisions as they, as they seek to ensure people remain safe and yet allow the countries to function in some way. We are thankful that so many people are conscious of their personal responsibility and are coming forward for vaccination. What a reminder for us all that for all the technology and modern day benefits we enjoy in this day and age, it can still be a tiny thing such as a virus that brings the world to its knees. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity so many have to slow down, to gather together as families and reflect on what is important in their lives. Help us to use this time wisely and well 
and to encourage and support those who are finding it stressful and demanding, such as parents homeschooling their children and teachers trying to balance home life and lessons online, etc., or those separated from loved ones by lockdown. We ask for safety and well-being for all healthcare staff, whatever their role. Please keep them all safe and well as they care for the sick. Thank you for wise and caring Christians who are using this time to connect to others and to share and encourage them in their work, walk with you. May we all think of others at this time and use our own time wisely and well. For our link missionaries, we pray. Father, they serve you in so many different parts of the world and we ask that you would keep them safe and well as they minister among the peoples where they live. Give them freedom from persecution and please give them many opportunities to share their faith. For those of our church family who are unwell or grieving the loss of loved ones or suffering the impacts of lockdown with the virus, we pray. Please, Father, give them all the comfort which only you can give and the assurance that you are there whenever we call on you. When all seems too dark or difficult, you are the one who loves and cares for us. Your word tells us that you never leave us. All we need to do is call on you. And Father, particularly at this time, we pray for the shortest family in Gunnedah here in the loss of Sebastian. For our ministry staff, we thank you for their steadfast and faithful service for us all, particularly at this difficult time. We are feeling so blessed and th so thankful. Please keep Simon and Jenny and Alex and David and Joanne and the boys and Helen safe and well also as they minister to us all. We are very thankful for all those who help to keep the church functioning all the time in whatever ministries. They serve you as they serve us. Lastly, Father, we pray for ourselves. Please help us to serve you better this week. May we always see Jesus as the example, whether at home, at work, and, that, and we pray that we would seek to love and care for others wherever we are able. And we ask all these things in the dear name of, of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, here's an update from Bree about our link missionaries in Lightning Ridge. Kurt and Beck Langmead. Hi everybody, just a quick update on Kurt and Beck and what's been happening out at the Ridge as of late. Things have been understandably quiet on the ministry front with lockdown and restrictions in place. However, I'm ecstatic to announce that things haven't been so quiet on the home front since the arrival of Timothy Peter Langmead on the 21st of August. Tim was born at Dubbo Base Hospital, weighing 10 pounds, 7 ounces. Kurt reports that Beck was a superhero. Bub and Mum are healthy and at home with the rest of the family now, and we praise God for the safe arrival of the littlest Langmead. Just a stop press update on the New Life Women's Conference planned for next Saturday. Obviously, it won't be able to happen in person, but it will still be on online, so ticket holders will be informed of details of how to access that. Um, by email. Now just an update about the AGM. As was mentioned last week, uh, we're not able to have the AGM, but what we do have is the opportunity to ask questions about the reports uh, in, in the annual general reports, uh, or if you have questions about the budget, which are also in the uh, report as well, then those uh, questions need to be submitted by Wednesday the 1st, this coming Wednesday, uh, so that they can be dealt with at this Wednesday's Parish Council meeting. So do send those to Simon and then the um, answers to those, responses to those will be published uh, soon, hopefully next Sunday. And do, as we've encouraged you before, do keep in contact with each other, give a friend from church a call, give uh, a non-Christian friend of call just to see how they're going yeah, and, and show care for each other in that way. Now many of us have been following the situation in Afghanistan which has been quite distressing and some have expressed helplessness uh, about that situation and what we can do. Obviously it is good to pray and that is no small thing uh, but there's also an opportunity to help refugees who are trying to flee from the situation the Anglican Relief and Development Fund Australia, or ADFA, 
is working on the ground with Christians in neighbouring countries of Pakistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan uh, and aiming to support Afghan refugees who are fleeing the country. So support will go out through local Christians in those other countries uh, to provide packs for refugees yeah, to help them out. So including food provisions, medical attention, uh, help with temporary accommodation. Uh, so if you're interested in supporting that, there is some details in the bulletin and hopefully also a link to a video about the work of ADFA uh, should be included with this um, Facebook or Vimeo um, link as well. It was great to have a lot of people join us on Zoom for morning tea last Sunday at 11 o'clock. It's on again this week, a great way to catch up and stay connected if you're able to do that. But wherever you are, I encourage you to think about this question from the study series we've been doing on uh, Esther, on the Bible study on chapter four. The last question is this, how can you, like Esther, and above all, like Jesus, be faithful where God has put you? In your work, in your home, with the people around you, your life situation, how can you be pointing people to Jesus, our mediator, in your words and actions? Well, keep looking to Jesus this week, and I look forward to seeing you again next week uh, for our next exciting part in our series on Esther. See you then.